This Sunday morning, I want to look at a scripture, and we're going to go to the Old Testament, and we're going to talk in the next few weeks. I want to focus on a particular character of the Bible. Last week, the pastor was talking about Samson as he was walking by the vineyards, and, and the lion, the young lion, came roaring to Samson, and Samson was able to destroy the lion like it was a baby goat, the Bible says. And I, I always was been fascinated by the story of Samson. And today we're going to look at Judges 13. And we're going to look at the life of Samson. But specifically today, I want to look at the birth of Samson. There's something amazing in the revelation of the Word of God that I hope that you're able to understand what God is trying to speak to us today. And in Judges 13, it says the birth of Samson. It says, again, the Israelites did evil. In the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. And a certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was Sarah and remained childless. And the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are Sarah and childless, but you are going to conceive and have a son. Now see to it that you do not drink no wine or other fermented drink, and that you do not eat anything unclean, because you will conceive and give birth to a son. And no razor may be used on his head, because the boy will be a Nazarite, set apart to God from birth, and he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Then the woman went to her husband and told him, A man of God came to me and looked like an angel of the Lord. Very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, you will conceive and give birth to a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink, and do not eat anything unclean, because the boy will be a Nazarite from, of God from birth until the day of his death. And then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, I beg you, let the man that God, that God, of God you sent to us come to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. God heard Manoah. And the angel of the Lord came again to the woman while she was out in the field, but the, her husband Manoah was not with her. The woman hurried to tell her husband, he's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and followed, followed his wife. And when he came to the man, he said, are you the one who talked to my wife? I am, he said. When we look at the context of this revelation word of the story of Samson, you have to think in mind that when we think of Samson, we think of a strong, muscular, gym body type. We think of a man with glowing, flowing, long hair. We think of somebody who was deceived by Delilah. But when we also look at the story of Samson, we see that there's more to this. And today I want to look at the beginning of the birth of Samson because in the birth of Samson there is a lot of mystery but there's also a lot of revelation that we will notice later on in his life. Why did certain things happen the way they did and why didn't some other things happen the way they was? It wasn't easy to hear from God that you were going to raise a judge. He wasn't going to be a prophet. He wasn't going to be a leader. But he was going to be the one who was going to judge the people of God. The book of Judges comes after the book of Joshua. Joshua is dead. Joshua is gone. And the people of God, now that they have the promised land, they fall into false idol worship. They got what they wanted. They fought so many years. Many generations from the beginning of the slavery of God's people from when the moment that Joseph brought all of his family back into Egypt, 400 years of slavery, 40 years of wandering the desert, another 30 years to gain the promised land and for them to easily turn around and say, we don't want anything to do with God. And so the period of governing of the people of Israel is done by judges. Every time Israel gets in trouble, God sends a man of God. And the people say, Lord, free us from our enemies. Free us from the people that oppress us. 
They cry to the Lord. The Lord sends them a judge, a military or a civil leader to save them. And they go through a period of peace. The judge would die and the people would rebel. And we would have the story over and over and over and over again. And this is where we start seeing the Amalekites, the Midianites, the Moabites, the Philistines begin to attack the people of God over and over and over and over again. Like the pastor said last week, they would go through the period of harvest and take away everything that they had. And here we see a period in Judges 13. It says in verse 1, again, again, Israel failed. Again, Israel did evil. Again, Israel turned to false gods. Again, they screwed up. And this is a period of darkness. A period of turmoil. A period where there is no leader. A period where there is no faith. A period where people have given up hope on God. God is nothing more than somebody that you order to set you free. But is not somebody you develop a relationship with. And that is the toughest part about the book of Judges. That God is wanting to establish the, the covenant and keep it with his people. God is saying only because Moses has died doesn't mean my covenant is not real. Only because Joshua is gone doesn't mean my covenant is not real. Why do you need to depend on a leader to show you who I am? Why do you need to depend on somebody to lead you to worship in order for you to sing to me? Why do you need somebody to stand in a pulpit in order for you to read your Bible? You do not need a man or a woman to guide you. What you need to have is a connection with me. I need to know you. I need to have fellowship with you. I need to have contact with you. And that's what the book of Judges is all about. God wanted to establish a connection with his people. But the people don't care about having a connection with God. All they want is a hero. All they want is a deliverer. All they want is a savior. All they want is somebody that will set them free. But they don't change. I want God to bless me. I want God to heal me. I want God to do this for me. But yet we don't change inside. We continue doing what we do. We continue judging people. We don't see people for who they are. We don't see people because of their faults. Because we don't see people because they have imperfections. But we, just like the judges in the book of Judges, we judge people according to what our own perception is of right and wrong. And in the beginning of Judges 13, not only was it a dark period, but it was a period of 40 years that the people of God were handed to the Philistines. And here we see several components. We see Manoah, the father of Samson. We see Manoah's wife, the mother of Samson. We see the angel of the Lord make an appearance. And even though we have all these ingredients, we seem to have one major issue. And that is Manoah's wife, Mrs. Manoah, is not able to have a child. She is not able to have life within her. She is not able to conceive life. And now she's not able to sustain life. For you see, the womb of Mrs. Manoah is a reflection of Israel. They want God, but they're not able to have life. They want a relationship with God. But they're not able to sustain a, a period of praise and worship with him. And just 
as Mrs. Manoa wants to have a child, God desperately wants to establish a connection with the people of God. And yet both her womb and the people of God are sterile. Both her and the people of God are dead inside. Both her and the people of God have great desires. But there's nothing to show for what they want. And there's nothing more frustrating in life being in a place of knowing what you want. And, being, and having to realize that you're not able to get it. The story of Mrs. Manoah is familiar because we have seen other women in the Bible who were barren. We see Sarah, Rebecca, Hannah, and even Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, who gave birth to pretty amazing people in the Bible. And see this story of a woman who wants to bring be pregnant is not about a woman who just wants to have a child, but it's God showing that when there is hope, God will give a provision that even though things don't look like they want, you want them to see God, if he is in the middle of what needs to happen, what seems to be dead, what seems to be irreversible, what the specialists have no answer for, what the prison system can't correct, uh, what the addiction problem, you've gone through any, many addiction recovery programs and nothing seems to reverse what has happened. God can turn it around. Uh, God can change it. God can make it a new. God can give it a new beginning. God can set it free. Uh, And when he, the angel of the Lord comes to Mrs. Manoah, he says, the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are sterile and you are childless. If I was her, I would say, yes, Captain Obvious, you have told me something I already know. I know that I've been wanting to have a child. But I know that I'm childless. I know that I've been wanting to have a child, but I am sterile. I'm not able to maintain life within me. But I thank the Lord that he does not just tell me what I know, but he also tells me what I don't know. Because he says, you are childless and you are sterile, but you are but you shall. And that is the word that somebody needs to hear this Sunday morning. Uh, that everybody tells you, you are too broke. Uh, that you are too needy. That you will never change your thoughts. Uh, that depression will always be with your family. That anxiety will not set you free. Uh, that uh, diabetes has always followed the genetics of your family. But the more greater than the angel of the Lord is here. And will say to you and me, yes. Those things are true, but you shall be free, but you shall be healed, but you shall have peace, but you shall be a blessing, but you shall be of abundance. There's nothing impossible for our God when he is in the midst. And he was there not to entertain her. He was not there to console her. He was not there to make her happy. But he came with the purpose to give a word of life. Uh, the word of God is life. Uh, and it's life active. It's greater than dynamite. You better say, Lord, set it off in my life, Lord. Speak again, Lord. Speak your word. Speak it again now. See, what we do is we do the opposite. We say, Lord, I am barren and I'm childless. And the Lord wants to speak. And you keep saying, but, but it's too late. But, but, but I'm too old. But, but, but I'm too broke. But it's not going to happen. But people don't love me. But I can't go back to school no more. But my children have already left the house. We are the ones that put the excuses. The angel of the Lord says, before you even say anything, I know 
what's in your heart. And I know that what's in your heart and what's in your mind does not relate to what you want to happen in your room. There's nothing more difficult than wanting something, but know you're going to fail. You have tried. You have tried over and over and over and over, and you have just failed. And maybe she felt betrayed by God all these years. Maybe she felt that she had been forgotten by God. But God was waiting for the darkest moment. Not just in the history of Israel. Not when the Philistines had taken them over for 40 years. But he was also waiting when Mrs. Manoah had no other recourse than to take hold of the word of God. If you're going to keep rebutting God for everything that he says, his word will never come true. But in the darkest of hours is when sunlight is about to break through in the morning. And he was saying to Miss Manoah, your, your nation is destroyed. Your people are lost. You are with your child. But let me tell you that in the middle of disorder, in the middle of chaos, just like in Genesis 1, 1, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. When he was saying to Mrs. Manoah, you don't understand because the child I'm going to put inside your womb, his name is Samson and his name means light. And when I said, let there be light, there will be light light in the darkness. There'll be light when there's no hope. There'll be light when there's persecution. There'll be light when there's nothing left on the dining room table. There will be light when the devil said there's going to be death. There will be light when the enemy said you cannot have this. There will be light because the word of God does not return void. He says, Mrs. Manoah, you're going to give birth to a child and his name shall be Samson. Samson means light. Samson means the sun. Samson means brightness. You're going to have something new in your life. Uh, you're going to have a new skip in your step. Uh, what you thought was never going to happen. Uh, you're going to have your own nursery. What you thought was never going to happen. You're going to watch a baby take a first step. Uh, what you thought was never going to happen. You're going to enroll your child in JK and SK. What you thought was never going to happen. God can make it happen because God is not a man to lie to us. And God has never met a mountain that he cannot move. God has never met a sea that he cannot separate. And God has never met an obstacle that he can't make it bow down at his feet. And he says, this boy, this boy is going to be special. He says, he will be a Nazarite. And he says to her, no razor may be used on his head. Set apart from God, to God from birth. And he will be the deliverance of Israel from the Philistines. Now, if you want to read more about the Nazarite vow, that's found in Numbers chapter 6. But quickly, what a Nazarite was, was a man of God that was been separated, set apart. And you know, what was interesting about being a Nazarite is that you could not drink any fermented wine. You could not touch dead human bodies. What's interesting about Nazarite is that your hair could not be cut. What was also interesting about a Nazarite is that the vow was only for a certain period of time. 
it wasn't forever. Other people that were Nazarites in the Bible was Samuel. Another Nazarite in the Bible was John the Baptist. But they were Nazarites forever. But God had chosen Samson to be a Nazarite from birth till death. Now, imagine being Mrs. Manoah and you hear the wonderful news. You're going to have a son. And she says, okay, okay, I'm going to have a son. And he cannot drink. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. He cannot drink wine. We, it's okay, it's okay. We can do that. But he says, he's going to be different. Set apart from God. Yeah, I'll take him to Sunday school. I will do whatever God asks me to do. But he cannot cut his hair. Oh. See, it's good that my child has been called by God, but I don't want him to be defined as different because there's something on the outside. See, the boy was always going to have long, long, long hair. So no matter what she tried to hide it underneath the hat, the hair would fall out. No matter how many times she tried to braid it, that hair would continue to grow. So there was always going to be something on the outside of Samson that even though people would not understand what she had to go through, what she had to struggle with, her son was always going to be uh, one sticking out like a sore thumb. And no parent wants any of their children to be little, to be bullied, or to be set aside by other friends by something on the outward. Whether it be because of their appearance, whether it be because of their clothes, whether it be because of the family they come from. All of us want our children to be accepted for who they are and what they are. But God said to her, not only is he not going to drink, not only is he set aside from God, but no razor can touch his head. And she became concerned that people were going to ask her, why does your boy not cut his hair? Why is he different than any other boy? And to have a child that you've been wanting to have for so long, and yet have that child be marginalized, have that child be set aside for ridicule, even though you know it's part of God's will, she said to herself, I don't know if I'm comfortable with this. Not only is he going to be different, the angel said to her, but he is going to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. How do you know that preacher? How do you know she had issues with those things? Read it in verse 7. When she delivers the message to her husband, two things she forgets to tell him. He says, but he said to me, you will conceive and give birth to a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink and do not eat anything unclean because the boy will be Nazarite of God from birth unto the day of his death. There's never mentioned anything about no haircuts. And she never mentions how he is going to deliver the people of God. You and I have to be careful that the word of God is not like just like taking a selfie on your cell phone. Have you seen people to take selfies on their cell phone? They take the picture, they change the angle, they change the look. Oh, I look too fat, I look too skinny, I look too old. And then after they take the picture, they filter the picture. Oh, take all the gray hair. Oh, take all those wrinkles. And, and then they post the picture because it shows them as most, the most positive side that they can be. Well, that's what she did with the, what the revelation that the angel said to her. She said, husband, this is what the angel said to me. But she filtered the word of God to fit what she wanted. If she filtered the word of God to make it seem like the way she wanted things to be. And the Bible says the 
that anytime you manipulate the word of God, it's like witchcraft. Uh, and what she was trying to do was manipulate the word of God to fit her idea of what her boy should have been like. She thought that he was going to be what she imagined him to be. Oh, I imagine him going to school. What about if he drops out? Oh, I imagine my daughter getting married and having a beautiful family, but she got pregnant at 15. What do you do when life does not meet the filter that you have thought it was going to be like? When you think that life should be one certain way, yet the word of God does not match up to what you wanted to hear. And she begins to manipulate the word of God quickly. She gets the revelation of the angel by verse 5. And in less than two verses, she's already changed it. And this is going to be a problem for Samson later on. Because he is going to learn the spirit of manipulation. That when I want certain things, I will do them my way and ask God later. And that's the issue that we have with people today. They say, well, if God is real, why am I in this situation? If God is love, how come people hate me? If God is such a blessing, how come everything in my life is falling apart? The reality is, did you ask God before you did the original choice, whether he was in the midst? Or are you just blaming God for a bad choice you made, and now you want God to fix it? This was going to be a huge problem later on. The wanting to manipulate the will of God to meet my need. See, it's not, it's not, it wasn't enough that God was going to give our child. But I want a child the way I want it. I want to have a daughter the way I want it. I want to have a family the way I want it. I want to have a career the way I want it. But what about when God says that you're going to have those things, but there might be just a little different. See, a lot of times, is that it's not that we have a sterile spiritual womb. That the word of God does not take hold. Is the fact that when we receive revelation word, we want to manipulate it into our own circumstance. And we think the devil is a liar. And the enemy is out to destroy me. Uh-uh. You changed the message. You changed the message of what God was trying to tell us. And because you tried to manipulate, because you tried to filter it, because you tried to control it, things are not working out the way you thought they were going to work out. And instead of having a great blessing, it could turn out to be a greatest headache. And that is one of the things that we as parents have to be conscious of. The message for Samson that he was going to be a Nazarite set apart for God was not just for Samson, but it was also for his parents. They needed to teach Samson that you were different because we worship a God that is different. You are different because your God has called you to be something greater than what we are. You are called light because you are the son of the light of God. Uh, then the way that God created in his image and his likeness. Do not be afraid when people make fun of your hair that you look like a girl. Don't be afraid of that, Samson, because God has called you for something greater than the critique and the ridicule of people. He said, people are going to label you, label you so many things, Samson. But don't worry about that. You're bigger than that. You were a special boy. You were, you were conceived by the word of God. That what man cannot do, the revelation word of God, when it hit my womb, something started. When, when, your, husband, when my, your daddy could not get me pregnant, yet the word of God, as soon as it was revealed, what had been dead came back to life. Uh, what had been destroyed began to have life again. Uh, and somebody needs to hear that today, that you cannot manipulate the word of God to feed to meet your circumstances. 
says to fit your need. It is us who are the clay and he is the potter. He will mold us. He will change us. He will manipulate the circumstances as they need to happen. But there's also another problem. Because her husband, instead of rejoicing, he's like, what? an angel of the Lord talked to you? You didn't get his name? You don't know where he's from? But you know that he is awesome? Who is this guy? Who, who texted you? Who, who reached out to you on Facebook? Who is this guy that said you're now going to have a baby? Uh, how are you going to get that baby? Is that a baby from God? Or is he going to have something to do and get that baby inside of you? I don't understand what's going on. You know how us males are. <laughs> you think women get jealous? We get so insecure. And he says to her, well, who is this guy? And where is he from? And how would you meet him? And, 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 and what else did he say? And what else did he do? And is he coming back? And if he's coming back, come on, talk to him. <laughs> and he prays to God, Lord, let that angel that spoke to my wife meet me face to face. Because I want to talk to him again. Oh, I got a few words for him too. Oh, he's got revelation word. Trust me, I got some revelation word for him too. I need to tell him not to talk to my wife when I'm not there. And I need to tell him that he's got no business telling my wife what's going on inside her body. How does he know? How did he check? How? And God hears Manoah. But when he appears again, he does not appear to Manoah. He appears to the woman, his wife, in the field. Why would he not appear to the man that asked him to appear? Is God afraid of Manoah? Is God not man enough to deal with Manoah? Or is it the fact that the angel had to go back to Mrs. Manoah and say, you did not give your husband the whole message. See, you're out in here in the field trying to grow something, but the field will never give you the right fruit because you never trusted God with all of your heart. And it's not about me having to answer to your husband. It's about you having to answer to the word of God. That you need to go back and realize that you did not say everything you needed to say. What would happen if God would confront us that way? That would God would find us at our work. That God would find us on our way to, on our commute to school. And speak to us again and say, I know that your parents don't believe in me. I know that you don't think it's going to happen, but I need to go back to you. Because it is the source of who I gave the message to that I need to go back to. And the angel of the Lord came back to Mrs. Manoah and said, we need to talk. We need to talk. Because the reason why your husband does not believe me is because he's got trust issues with you. And the reason he's got trust issues with you is because you don't tell him everything that he needs to hear, even though it's the right word from God. You and I need to have open communication as husband and wife, as child or a parent. We need to talk to each other openly and honestly. Because if we don't, we are delaying the revelation word of God. It's not about me trying to make you to be my friend. It's not about you trying to hear something that you just want to hear. Sometimes the word of God is like a double edged sword. It cuts you and it cuts me. But we both need to hear what God has to say. Yeah. 
It's interesting. Because Manoah says, I need to hear from that angel. It's not good enough to what my wife told you. I need to hear it from the angel itself. And that is also a reflection of Israel. Israel had been led from Egypt. Israel had been saved by the Red Sea from the Pharaoh. Israel had been given the law. Israel had been provided for in the wilderness. Israel had gone into the promised land. Israel possessed everything that they had to possess in the land. And yet they say to God, show us that you're real. And the only way that you will know that you're real is by sending us a judge that will deliver us and save us. We begin to see a pattern of a reflection of a broken family. A woman who is barren, a husband who doesn't trust her, and a family who says, even though God has spoken, we're not sure if he's real. Manoah says, I need proof. I need to see this. I need to see what's going on. When God says something, that's it. God wasn't asking you for your opinion. God wasn't asking for questions. When God says something, it says, that's it. Stop. Don't question it. Don't say anything. Just zip it. Be quiet. Have you ever said that to your kids? You tell them, do something. But dad, uh, but, 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 uh, it's not fair. Oh, can you give me five more minutes? Oh, how come my sister doesn't? Ah, I wasn't talking about her. I wasn't about talking about giving you five more minutes. I'm saying, do it now, period, end of story. Do it. But Manoah is not satisfied. Unless I see the angel myself, he says. It's not, about, it's not about the fact that you're going to have a baby. It's not that you're going to have an heir. It's not the fact that he's going to be a Nazarite. It's not the fact that he can't cut his hair. It's not about the fact that he's going to deliver the people. He says, ah, i got a problem. What's your problem, Manoah? God didn't tell me. And unless God tells me, I'm not believing in him. Have you met people like that? Unless God tells me in a dream, I'm not believing God. Unless God shows me in the Bible exactly the right verse, I'm not believing in God. He was stubborn. His wife may have been sterile in the womb, but Manoah was sterile in the heart. Both were covered with death. No wonder they couldn't have a baby. And maybe Manoah got word about the angel. Because maybe Manoah realized that maybe the reason why his wife couldn't conceive maybe was because of him. Because he didn't have the heart to believe. Honey, why do you want to have a baby now? I mean, don't you know that we're happy with our life? We got a dog, we got a cat, we can vacation, we can travel, we can do whatever we want. Why would you want a baby now? No, don't you understand? When we have a baby, you just can't go out. When you have a baby, you don't get to sleep in. When you have a baby, you don't have the finances to do whatever you want. When you have a baby, you have to get somebody to watch the child. It's just not fair. We don't have any freedom. And that's what Israel was saying to God. We want to deliver, but yet we complain was the deliverer come because it doesn't meet our agenda. It doesn't meet my criteria. It doesn't meet my idea. And what Manoah was saying was a reflection of who we are today. That we want connection with God, but we don't want to open our Bibles. We want to be blessed, but we don't want to bring a tithing. We want to have praise, but we don't want to chase the music that we listen to in the car. We want God to meet my agenda, and it's not about me trying to fit into the plans of God. Mama's manipulating the word of God because of what she says to her husband. And the husband is trying to manipulate the word of God so that he's able to understand it. And then you wonder why Samson was so messed up. Because his parents didn't believe the revelation word of God. 
And sometimes we have to be honest with ourselves and say, maybe, just maybe, the issues that I'm having at home begin with me looking at myself in the mirror. That I cannot be one person in church and be a different person on the way home from church. That when they say, we got to praise God, I cannot say other things that don't meet the vocabulary of God. I got to be who I am, where I am, because that is God, and that is how God wants me to live my life. And yet, instead of rejoicing, instead of thanking God that his wife's womb is going to be filled with life, he keeps putting bondage over it. Show me the angel. Show me who he is. Show me where he's from. We have to be so careful. The Bible says, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. And when you are married, you have to be so aware that the two of you are walking hand in hand in the spirit. Because one cannot want something and the other one put bondage over the word of God. Because you'll never get anywhere. You will never get anywhere. You have to be in constant communication with God and with each other. And saying, baby, if this is what God is telling us to do, that we will trust in the Lord, that he will provide a way, that he will move what needs to happen. Things are already moving that we don't know that are happening, but God will show us. Uh, because when God says, let it there be light in the middle of the darkness, darkness has no fellowship with light. Uh, and once light enters, things begin to change. Once light enters, colors begin to show up. Once when light enters, things begin to be different. And so when Samson was going to be born, he was going to only, not only bring light to the darkness of Israel, but he's always going to bring light to the relationship between Manoah and his wife. We have to be always aware that it wasn't just Samson that needed to be set apart. It was the whole house. That's why Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah 1 verse 5. We have to be parents that have parenting for a purpose. We have to give our children the ability to be equipped to deal in a world. Because sometimes we forget to see this, but we are not going to be around forever. We're not going to be alive forever. But we got to instill in our children that maybe we don't see it today, but they will know who the God that they worship that maybe today they're rebellious, but tomorrow they will come to know the Lord. Uh, maybe today they're a prodigal son, but tomorrow they will be coming back into the fold. Uh, you cannot live life by what you see today, because what you see today will deceive you. But if you say to God, I know that you knew my children before I knew their mother. I know that you have a plan for them, a plan to bless them, a plan to prosper them, a plan to make them great that I put them in your hands oh God that even though I fail that even though I have many shortcomings even though I'm impatient even though I get angry even though I have all these issues I know Lord that you are above everything that at the feet of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is still Lord Not easy because he gives them what needs to happen but how, how, besides not cutting his hair and there's no way you're gonna give beer or wine to a little baby so we don't have to worry about that till he gets older how do we instruct this child how do we develop a relationship how do I make sure I don't make the wrong decision? How do I make sure I don't screw this up? 
And one of the mistakes that his parents make, that we also make as parents, is that we become more concerned about the calling than the God who called them. We want them to have the perfect life, the perfect situation. And when things don't line up, we say, what did I do wrong? How come I messed up? Instead of saying, God, I know the calling. I know that you have prepared a way for them. But let me show them the God who called them. Let me know who that God is. Moses did not know he was going to be the deliverer of people of God because he was 80. And it came from a burning bush in the middle of a mountain. How do you know that this is a mistake? At 80 years old, Moses heard the voice of God say, Moses, Moses, where do you stand is holy ground. What makes you think that by the age of 25 it's already lost? What makes you think that by the age of 40 and it's their second divorce, they're not going to get it? Sometimes God does things in his own time. And if he says he will do it, he will make sure that it happens because God knows no time. God knows no limitation. And God knows no devil that has ever defeated him. He said, his child needs to have a relationship with me. And even though, as you read on the story of Samson, and that's going to be your homework for the next couple of weeks, Judges 14, 15, and 16, we see that Samson kills a lion with his bare hands. Samson kills the Philistines. Samson catches 300 foxes and torches the fields. Samson kills a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Samson carries a gate of the city to the top of the mountain. But also, Samson touches a dead body. Samson falls in love with three women. He falls in love with a Philistine woman. He sleeps with a prostitute. And then falls in love with a lion. Samson has his hair cut. And yet, one of the people that mirrors the story of Jesus the most in the Bible is Samson. Both were born miraculously. Both angels announced their births. Both came to deliver their people. Both had the Spirit of God residing in them. Both came to have a Gentile wife. And Jesus, even though he physically did not get married, he got married to a church that was not of Jewish descent because you and me are his bride. Both spoke with things of riddles and parables. Both were betrayed by somebody they loved. And both used their deaths to defeat their enemies. As we read beyond Judges 13, the toughest part is trying to save somebody that does not want to be saved. I remember when we were little, we had little budgies, little parakeets. And we were, we always had these little two little birds. My brother was the blue one, and I had the green, yellow one. And, and mine was the female, his was the male. And the female killed the boy. <laughs> the devil is a liar. And, and so we were like, what are we going to do? So we opened the cage door, opened the door, and tried to set her free. We're like, well, you, well, what are we going to do? We're not going to buy you another one. We're not going to be a accomplice to another murder. <laughs> and we're like, well, so you got to go. And the parrot would not go. She would not leave. She would not leave the cage. I'm like, you got to go. 
And she yelled with her leave. And this is the reality of Samson. He wants to set a people free that don't want to be free. He wants to set a people free that will never be thankful. He wants to set a people free that will never know relationship with God. And nothing tougher in life than trying to help somebody that does not realize that they need help. And if anything, the story of Samson is a reflection of her humanity. No, we want a deliverer. And yet when the deliverer comes, we say it's too late. It's not going to happen. What's the use of it? We live in a world that everybody has a cause. Whatever the cause may be, environment. Whether it be for clean energy. Whether it be for whatever situation, everybody's got a cause they believe in. But sometimes we believe more in the name of the cause than the cause itself. You know, it's good to send boxes overseas to children that need it. But what about the child in your neighborhood that needs your love? Do you extend that love? The story of Samson is about a man that is called by God to deliver a people that don't want to be delivered. He is set, called to bring light to a people that still want to live in their darkness. One of the things I want to leave you with is that when the angel of the Lord came to Manoah, Manoah said, I want to feed you. The angel said, I'm not going to eat your food. I'll stay, but I'm not going to eat your food. He said, instead of giving me the food you're going to make me, why don't you sacrifice it to God? So he goes to a rock, puts the grain on the rock, and kills a goat. And the goat is set on fire. And in the flames of the fire, a miracle happens. Because the angel of the Lord, which is a reflection of Jesus. Anytime you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, is a reflection of Jesus. The angel of the Lord appeared to Joshua and told Joshua they were going to take the city of Jericho. That is Jesus. And if we see here the angel of the Lord appear to him, and a goat is killed. And I thought to myself, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. why would he kill a lamb? Why would he kill a bull? Why would he kill a goat? And in the Old Testament, God told Aaron that they, when he was going to make a special sacrifice for the sin of the people, they needed to be two goats. One goat was going to be killed, and the other goat was going to be put away into the wilderness, for he was going to carry the sins of the people into the desert. That's where we get the term scapegoat. That would be the goat that would go into the wilderness, and the sin would die with that goat out in the middle of nowhere. And God said to me, read that again. Because there were two goats in that offering. Mm -hmm. One was the gift of the sin offering that was burned by Manoah. But why did the angel of the Lord ascend to heaven in the flames? Because he was also bringing the sin of God's people into the throne of God. Because even though God told Aaron put him into the wilderness, God does not take your sin in the middle of nothing. God takes your burdens. God takes your problems. God takes your diseases. God takes your shortcomings. God takes your trauma. And he does not put it in the middle of no wilderness. But he ascends in the middle of your fire. And he takes it to the throne of God. Where he is an intercessor for his people. For we have a lawyer. We have a counselor. He is wonderful. He is mighty. He is Prince of Peace. His kingdom shall go. Prophetically, even though Manoah didn't understand, your son will be a judge, but the law's got limitations. Your son will be mighty, but his muscles cannot save him. What you need to understand that if you live by law, you're gonna die by the law. But there's one who lives by grace, and he is.
is not limited by the strength of human. He is not limited by the mindset of human potential. He is not limited by his own wisdom. But he is the Son of God that ascends and descends to heaven. Jesus, the angel said to the people at the cross that Jesus you see today going into heaven. He is going there to prepare a place for you and me. He is not done. He is not done. He is still working miracles. He is still working signs. He is still in wonder because he is the scapegoat that took my pain. He is the scapegoat that took my limitations. That's why Peter would write later on in 2 Corinthians. He says, 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I know, Manoah, that what you're doing right now, you're thinking you're pleasing God. You think that by giving me an offering, by killing the goat, that's enough. But Manoah, I know what's in your heart. But Noah, I know what's in the heart of your wife. And I need to take that sin away from you. I need to take it away from you. See, the dangers that we run into is not the fact of the things that we confess to God. It's the things that we don't confess to God because we like to do them over and over and over again. He said, I know you're trying to please me by doing this offering. But you don't understand. There's still sin in your heart that you're trying to cover. That I need to take to the throne of God. On this Sunday morning, there is one greater than one called Samson. He is the light of the world. He is the bread of God. He is the good shepherd. And today, he is looking for you and me to establish a relationship. Don't ask for a healer if you only want him to heal what you think should be healed. But if you ask for a healer, say, Lord, heal me from head to toe. Give me a cat skin in the spirit. It's not just my elbow that hurts. Heal this heart. Heal this mind. And that was the limitation of the people of God. They wanted to be rescued from the Philistines. They wanted to be rescued from the Midianites and the Canaanites. But what they needed to understand, it wasn't a physical rescue. They needed to be rescued from the curse of the sin that was going to bring death upon them. And unless they changed their ways, unless they changed their worship, unless they changed the way they connect with God, you will always have enemies. You will always have problems. But if you don't change the condition of your heart, you are dead. What's it worth it to me having the healthiest body? What is the worth for me to live away from pills and problems if I know I'm going to have the second death? And that one's going to be more painful because that one's for eternity. We have to revalue the way we come to God. And we cannot have filters when we deal with God because God is God above everything else. God bless you. Quiero decirles algo. I just want to say the following to you. Cuando el ángel consumió la ofrenda, when the angel of the Lord consumed the offering, se rompió la maldición de muerte que había en el vientre de la esposa de Manoah. The curse of death that was in the womb of Mrs. Manoah was destroyed. Porque ahí ellos dos because the two ofrecieron una alabanza y una adoración a Dios. Offered a united praise and worship to God. Ahí los dos se humillaron. The two humbled themselves. Y ahí los dos se derramaron completamente en la presencia. And the two broke themselves and outpoured of themselves before the presence of God. 
Hermano, usted y yo podemos tener personas que oren por nosotros. You and I have people praying over us, laying hand over us. Y a veces las maldiciones no se rompen. And your curse is not broken. Hasta que nosotros nos humillamos en la presencia. Until de Dios. we humble ourselves before God. Y arreglamos nuestro altar familiar. And we fix our own family altar. Dios está aquí. God is in this place. Yo quiero que nos pongamos de pie. Let us all stand. Porque yo quiero hacer una oración general. Because I want to do a general prayer. Para que se rompa la maldición. So whatever curse is broken. Especialmente de la del altar. The curse over the altar. Para que cuando usted ore, usted se humille en la presencia. So that when you pray, when you humble yourself before the presence of God. Dios le sane de cualquier enfermedad. God will heal you from anything. Que Dios rompa cadenas y ataduras God en su vida. God will break chains and strongholds on your heart. Que Dios le abra puertas a usted. May God open doors that you didn't know were there. Que Dios le siga usando con poder y autoridad. And may God keep using you with power and authority. Padre en el nombre de Jesús. Father of Jesus. En esta hora, Señor. At this hour, oh God. Declaramos, Señor. We declare, Father. Que el Cristo de la gloria. The Christ of the glory. Va a romper toda maldición. Break every curse. De todo altar familiar. Or any family altar that's broken. Porque tu plan y tu propósito. Because your plan and purpose. Es bendecir cada familia que está aquí. Every family gathered. Es sanar a todo el que está enfermo en medio de ellos. All those that are sick of us. Es libertar a todo el que está cautivo es de abrirle los ojos a todos sus seres queridos es de remover cargas es de cambiar el lamento en baile Señor y en esta hora uno más grande que el ángel va a descender con fuego del cielo su nombre es el Alfa y el Omega. His name is Alpha and the Omega. Él es el principio, el fin de todas las cosas. El único digno de morir en la cruz del Calvario. Señor, cuando salgamos de este lugar, saldremos libres de ataduras, libres de maldiciones, libres de enfermedades. Y en esta hora, Señor, yo también envío palabra de sanidad. Donde está el hermano Wayne. Where our brother Wayne is. Señor, el enemigo ha estado atacando su cuerpo. The enemy has been attacking his body. Pero Dios mío, tú vas a tocarlo. God, you will touch. Donde está la dolencia, donde está el problema. Wherever the pain, wherever the issue is. Y ahí en el hospital, Señor. There in the hospital. Tú te vas a glorificar. You will glorify us. Tú lo vas a sanar. You will heal him. Tú lo vas a levantar. You will lift him up. Y tú vas a usarlo. And you will use him. Para seguir declarando la buena nueva. Declaring the good news. De que él adora un Cristo que que vive y reina para siempre también enviamos palabra para todos nuestros seres queridos que están enfermos a la distancia en el nombre poderoso de Jesús lo declaramos sanos en esta hora en el nombre del Padre en el nombre del Hijo y en el nombre de su Santo Espíritu Amen. Amen and amen. Let us sing that song that we were singing from the beginning. Oh, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are going to. We need to end with praise, hermanos. We need to end praise the Lord. Amen. The Bible says that God moves and dwells in the praise of His people. Amen.